humanity because this topic is so broad, but sadly we only have today. Amy was gonna speak on Afro-Caribbean femininity, however, she has lost her voice, so we will have five short speeches delivered by women who are a part of this community, students and teachers alike. They will cover a variety of topics that pertain to their identity as women and feminism as a whole. We would like to note feminism and femininity can differ in meaning to different people and also overlap with many other important identity factors such as race, class, and sexual orientation. In addition, we want to acknowledge that today is Trans Visibility Day. Trans women are often not included in the accepted definition of woman, and while this has improved in recent years, we still have a long way to go. Trans women are as female as cisgender women. One last thing, please hold your applause till the end of all five speeches. We only have a short time together, and we do not want to take away from anyone's time to speak. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So when I think of Women's History Month, I think, and I thank my ancestors who created new possibilities and new windows for themselves, for me, and for all of you. All of you, no matter what gender or sex you identify as. I think of my great-grandmother, Rebecca, who I am so proud to be named after. In 1906, Rebecca emigrated alone with her children to the United States from somewhere that today is either Russia or Ukraine. We don't know. Rebecca found her way to Lynn, Massachusetts, where she worked in a textile mill all day long and then taught herself English at night while her children slept beside her. And these are some family photos. I think there's a strong resemblance there that you might notice. Um, the black and white photo in the middle, that is my maternal grandmother, Anne. And this photo actually was taken by a newspaper right after she was elected president of her high school student body, even though the newspaper said, she is a girl. And you can see, like, that smile, she knows she just did something. I love that photo of her. It's my favorite one that I have of her. My Nana, Anne, she went on to become one of the trailblazing women to serve this country in World War II. Then she worked as a journalist for Time Life magazine in an age that expected her to stay at home. She had four children, including my mom, and her boundary pushing created a better, more potent life for herself and for her kids, one in which they knew, they saw, that they could have agency beyond their sex or gender. The picture on the left, that's my mom, Martha, and bearing the lead, that baby is me. <laughs> she dreamed of being a veterinarian in high school, okay? She tried to get a summer job at the vet's office in her hometown in New Jersey. She was turned away because they didn't hire girls. That's what they told her when she showed up. Martha, my mom, she carried that blunt, heavy rejection with her for years. And, in something that is kind of genetic in our family, she used that for fuel. Okay, my mom went to Barnard College because Columbia did not accept girls at that time. And then she became one of the first women to go to New York University's dental school. My mom, Martha, she was almost always the only girl in her classroom in dental school. And she took a lot of flack from a lot of guys while she was there. But there was one guy, her assigned lab partner, a guy named Jack. He was a great ally, and he stood up for her constantly. Side note, Martha and Jack fell in love, got married, had me, and they've been together for 50 years now. Martha, my mom, retired just this past winter as a recognized leader in dentistry. She also retired as a professor at NYU Dental School, the same school that she attended. She always went out of her way to mentor her female students, and more recently, her transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary students, those who had, like her, been judged and limited and put in boxes, and put outside boxes, based on their biological sex and gender. And so these family stories, they're not huge, right? They're not in a history book anywhere. I'm the only person that really knows them, okay? They're personal, they're individual, and they're kind of inconsequential in the broad collective scheme of our history. But when I look at them from this podium, I see generations, a family tree of power, of strength, 
of courage. And that powers me. And that photo on the right, that's our fancy Christmas card photo. That's me, right, my wife and our children, who you may know if you spend any time on this campus. And in writing these remarks, I tried to imagine what my kids would say about me, and I can only imagine <laughs> what they would say about me, if they got a chance to speak about Women's History Month in 30 years or so. And I note with humility and with great respect and with a special shout out to my queer family here at Brooks that today is Transgender Day of Visibility. And I hope that my kids would say that I actively and intentionally taught them that our definitions and understanding of gender have grown and evolved. And I hope they would say that I have taught them that our collective understanding of feminism and justice should grow and evolve to meet them. And that's hopeful for all of us. That's joyful for all of us. That's affirming for everybody in this room, regardless of your biological sex or gender identity. Because that's what this is really about, right? As our society comes to understand that humans are bigger than the binary, as we understand that biological sex and gender are not the same thing, as we understand that diverse gender identity and expression are reflections of how much possibility and potential and love our humanity holds. We understand that reaching past what has always been done creates more room for all of us, for all of us, to be who we truly are and who we truly can be. And my ancestors taught me that through their own dreams, their own actions, their own small rebellions, and I hope that I can teach my children that too. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm a queer woman, and I live in a straight society. Within that, I live in a small bubble filled with predominantly straight individuals. I am here to represent the women of the queer community, and especially the queer community here. I am tired and angry of being treated like an object, another statistic on a chart. I am tired of staying silent and being silenced. So I'm saying something today, and you're going to listen. When I first came out as bisexual to my friends at 13 years old, one of my close friends also came out to me. I was excited because I wasn't going to go through this unknown experience alone. Unfortunately, a group of boys overheard our private conversation. Later that day, they yelled at us from across the hall, hey, since y'all swing both ways now, why don't we get a threesome going? And then they called us the Epsler. I cried that day. I assume most people would after an incident like that. I went home depressed and disconnected from a community I once felt safe in. I couldn't tell my parents because they didn't know about my sexuality yet. I didn't want that story to be their first experience with my sexuality. I felt disgusted with myself. My skin crawled. I was basically a, a parasite living in my own body. I knew a part of why they treat me, treated me like that was because I was queer. However, another part of it was because I am a woman. Women have always been over-sexualized. It is easy for people to turn them into objects. It is built into modern society. It is especially easy to fetishize gay, queer, and trans women because of the lack of support or care for their identity. In the eyes of society, queer women are not equal to or the same as cis-het women. Queer women aren't real women because they don't fit the predetermined, predetermined objectifying role of female. For example, lesbian women don't fit the historical role of a woman. As a result, people fetishize lesbian relationships so they feel like they have some control over the unconventional female. The female gay community has been warped into little more than a fetish for the male gaze in an attempt to invalidate their sexualities. Simultaneously, they are attacked and made vulnerable by propaganda against the LGBTQ plus community, claiming their identity and who they love is unnatural. To some, my entire existence is viewed as unnatural. The combination of being queer and a woman paints a large target on my back. That's exactly why those boys felt comfortable saying such vulgar things about me. However, being a queer woman is something I am incredibly proud of. I belong to a community that some of the, has some of the strongest women in history. They push through all odds to show their unapologetic true selves. Josephine Baker, a woman, a woman civil rights activist, was the first African American to star in a motion picture and a part of the bisexual community. Helua Tisenogini, a Navajo Nation woman's rights 
a Navajo Native women's rights activist who is a two-spirit, meaning she has both female and male spirits. She advocates for Native women's rights through her art and photography. Sappho, a Greek lyrical poet from the island of Lesbos, was known for her beautiful writing and poems about homosexuality. Some terms regarding homosexuality, sapphic and lesbian, come from Sappho. The queer women of history have made a profound impact on our world, but are often written off as insignificant. However, I will not let myself or, pow or the powerful women who have come before me be insignificant. I will not let their hard work be overshadowed by fear of others who want to undermine me and the other women of the queer community. Like many others in my community, they use their sexuality as a shield to defend. I use my bisexuality as a desperate attempt to protect myself. At least when I was bisexual, I could say I liked men to make myself seem more normal. Later, I realized there is no normal, and I shouldn't have to hide myself in fear of what others would perceive me as. I am proud to stand here and say, with all of my unapologetic true self, that I am a lesbian and I am proud to be a woman. I want to apologize to all the women I have called pretty before I've called them intelligent or brave. I'm sorry that I made it sound as though something as simple as what you're born with is the most you have to be proud of when your spirit has crushed mountains. From now on, I will say things like you are resilient or you are extraordinary, not because I don't think you're pretty, but because you are so much more than that. I wanted to read this poem, Mountains, by Rupi Kaur today because it illustrates how, in society today, women's appearances tend to be valued before everything else they have to offer. And this can leave them feeling objected and objectified and dejected. It can cause them to think that they are not worth anything unless they meet certain standards. Media, especially social media, pushes this narrative because no matter what a woman achieves, there will always be someone focusing on what she looked like as she did it. This phenomenon is also supported by scientific studies. And one I found fascinating was a survey that asked 4,573 men and women what qualities they valued most in the other gender. The top quality valued in women was physical attractiveness over compassion, intelligence, and even competence. In contrast, men were valued for their honesty, professional success, and ambition. These kind of expectations and values are damaging to women in all stages of their lives, but especially young girls who are figuring out who they are and their place in the world. When I was 10, my friend Jay and I had to get homework tutors. Despite the fact that we performed pretty much equally in all the sessions, our tutor treated us differently. He would always give me extra work and never believed me when I said I understood something. Every session, I'd watch Jay get to leave before me and play with our friends when I had more work to finish. One day, I'd had enough, and I decided to confront him about it. My tutor replied that he only wanted to make sure I could do my work as well as Jay could, because according to him, girls were usually worse at math, and because Jay was a guy, he didn't need his extra attention. While my tutor had good intentions, his answer caused me to doubt my abilities in not only math, but other classes, and even in areas of my life that were unrelated, like club soccer. Before some of you walked into this chapel, and maybe even now, you might believe that sexism doesn't really exist in American society anymore. I understand where you're coming from, because women now have the right to vote, they can go to college, and they are able to and even encouraged to get jobs, just like men are. However, I pose the idea that sexism has not just disappeared, but maybe evolved into something more intangible. And a prevalent example is the cultural expectations on women today. I will never forget the frustration I felt with my tutor and his underestimations of me, and it has taken me a long time to get past that. It is important that as individuals, we examine the values we uphold in our daily lives, as well as the fact that we have the collective ability to shape societal expectations. Ultimately, the point of this speech and this poem is not to say that you can't compliment someone's appearance, but to emphasize the importance of recognizing and valuing contributions that women make in our everyday lives and society. Thank you.
Sitting in the audience right now, you may be wondering what we have all been rambling on about. Hasn't sexism mostly been eliminated, at least from modern stream society and corporate structures? After all, in the 21st century, women are presented with most of the same, if not the same, rights and opportunities as men. Women can vote, be CEOs, vice presidents, and they even attend college at higher rates than men. And while all of this is true, that doesn't change the fact that most women still face a lot of challenges, especially in their daily lives. Double standards and harmful stereotypes still try and push the women of today's age into a predetermined mold. For example, women are still expected to be their children's primary caregivers. Men still spend about 33% less time with their children every day compared to women, despite the fact that both the majority of women and men work full-time jobs. Moreover, cultural norms um, simply expect women to be natural caregivers. Many women cook, clean, and care for their families in a magnitude not met by their male counterparts, again on top of their regular jobs. In certain professions, stereotypes still prevail and present challenges. Women are not seen as good doctors, and they are seen as good nurses. Even in female-dominated fields, double standards are visible. Approximately two-thirds of all teachers are women, However, the distribution of gender is not equal among schooling levels or pay grades. 97% of preschool teachers are women, but on only 54% of school principals are, and 31% of full-time faculty at college and universities. We see that even though women make up the majority of workers in this field, they are statistically less likely to hold leadership positions or positions that require a higher degree. The double standards that I have mentioned above are just some of the many that affect women each and every day. These double standards are hard to recognize and repair due to their pervasiveness in our society. Just as you cannot hear your own accent, you often don't realize when you may be playing into a stereotype or setting different standards for someone based on their gender. To combat this, think of you would be questioning a person's actions, words, or appearance if they were the opposite gender. Would you question a man claiming to be a doctor? Probably not. So why is it excusable to question a woman's competence or to just assume that she's a nurse? These stereotypes and double standards are extremely detrimental and not just to women. Women are not questioned when they use makeup to supplement their appearance, yet there is a negative connotation associated with men who wear makeup. In my opinion, I believe that these stereotypes are extremely harmful to everyone in society as they place unneeded expectations on not just females but males as well. I believe everyone can take something away from this speech and the messages that I and all the other women here have shared. Women may have similar opportunities as men in the United States when it comes to civil rights, education, and other aspects of life, yet there is undoubtedly a difference between the societal standards of men and women, which can make the lives of women harder and more stressful. And in the end, regardless of which aspect a woman of her life a woman chooses to prioritize, whether that be her beauty, her career, her children, or something else, there will always be criticism about her decision and the choices that she makes. So I challenge you to reflect on any gender stereotypes you may hold and to strive to le look less critically at everyone. This past December, you could have found me at Center Ice at Warrior Arena with a one-month-old daughter on my lap and an eight-year-old daughter at my side. We looked down a line of ponytails coming out of the back of helmets as we took in the national anthem before the Boston Pride faced off against the Buffalo Buttes. I'll admit it, got a little dusty in there. Ainsley asked me a reasonable question, albeit in a slightly unreasonable tone. Mom, why are you crying? I tried to find the words to explain how it felt to take my hockey playing daughter to a professional women's ice hockey game. This was not an opportunity I had growing up this past Monday, the Boston Pride won a back-to-back -back Premier Hockey Federation Championship, which my children could watch on ESPN2. If you are going through security at Logan Airport's Terminal C, look up and you can see Boston Pride Championship banners hung alongside the Bruins, Celtics, Red Sox, and Pats. That representation matters. It is easier to be what you can see. Ainsley can dream of being a professional hockey player because she can see it. She even met one 
who came to coach a Brooks girls varsity practice. Shout out to Coach Holmes and Olympic, Olympic gold medalist Casey Bellamy, who gifted Ainsley a stick, which is now her most prized possession. When my five-year-old son Cal falls down playing soccer, he gets right back up because his sister tells him to be tough, like Carly Lloyd or Megan Rapino. As a family, we watch Kat Macario and Mallory Pugh smashing goals, and the Mewis sisters from Massachusetts dominate the midfield. When I was a little older than Ainsley, the U.S. women's national team won their second of four World Cups in 1999. Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, and Brandi Chastain showed me what it meant to be tough and to perform at the highest level in the world. Four World Cups, four Olympic gold medals, more ticket sales, more television viewers, more gear purchased. Yet U.S. women's national team soccer players have been woefully undercompensated as compared to their male counterparts, four to one. Girls' development programs across the country have received less than half the funding of boys' programs. In 2019, against the backdrop of a World Cup win in France and chance of equal pay at every match, the team filed a lawsuit citing the 1963 Equal Pay Act. In response, the U.S. Soccer Federation launched a defense that indisputable science pointed to the women players being inferior to men. 2019, people. The verdict ruled against the women, citing that they, in fact, did earn more money than the men during the years in question. This was true only because the men lost regularly and secured none of their win incentives. So the outcome was predicated on the women's success being their undoing and the men's lackluster performance undermining equal pay. Fortunately, new leadership of the USSF committed to finding a way forward. With former player Cindy Parlow Cohn at the helm, the U.S. women's national team will now get an equal rate, rate of pay for all friendlies and tournaments. They won a $24 million settlement, which will be distributed to players and fund charitable efforts for girls' soccer. While a major win, some worry about the precedent of women having to outperform men to be paid equally. This legal victory last month was historic. It was not without much sacrifice from the women soccer players who fought hard for it. I highly recommend the documentary LFG on HBO that follows their journey. Representation matters. Equal pay matters. Equal rights matter. Cheers to the 50th anniversary of Title IX and the generations of women who now have access to equal opportunities. Go team. That concludes all of our speeches today. I hope you have gained some new perspectives. I would like to remind everyone that Dr. Mary Frances Berry, who has been one of the most visible and respected activists in the cause of civil rights, gender equality, and social justice, is speaking tonight at 7 in the Art Center. Thank you for listening, and happy Women's History Month.